Peter Sloterdijk's Critique of Cynical Reason Preface Quoting Heinrich Heine, Doctrine Beat the drum and have no fear, and kiss the camp follower. That is the whole of science. That is the deepest of books' meaning. Quoting Otto Flake from Deutsch Französisches, 1912. The great defect of German thinkers is that they have no sense for irony, cynicism, the grotesque, contempt, and mockery. For a century now, philosophy has been lying on its deathbed, but it cannot die because it has not fulfilled its task. Its farewell thus has been tortuously drawn out. Where it has not found it in the mere administration of thoughts, it plods on in glittering agony, realising what it forgot to say during its lifetime. Faced with its demise, it would like now to be honest and reveal its last secret. It confesses. The great themes, they were evasions and half-truths, those futile, beautiful, soaring flights. God, universe, theory, praxis, subject, object, body, spirit, meaning, nothingness, all that is nothing. They are nouns for young people, for outsiders, clerics sociologists. Quoting Gottfried Benn, Epilogue und Lyrisches Ich. Words, words, nouns. They need only to open their wings and millennia fall out of their flight. End quote. The last philosophy, willing to confess, treats such things under a historical rubric together with the sins of youth. Their time has come. In our thinking, there is no longer any spark of the uplifting flight of concepts, or of the ecstasies of understanding. We are enlightened. We are apathetic. No one talks anymore for a love of wisdom. There is no longer any knowledge whose friend, Phylos, one could be. It does not occur to us to love the kind of knowledge we have. Rather, we ask ourselves how we might contrive to live with it without becoming ossified. What is presented here under a title that alludes to the great traditions is a meditation on the sentence, Knowledge is power. This is the sentence that dug the grave of philosophy in the 19th century. It sums up philosophy and is at the same time its first confession, with which the century-long agony begins. This sentence brings to an end the tradition of a knowledge that, as its name indicates, was an erotic theory. The love of truth and the truth through love. Liebesverheit. From the corpse of philosophy arose the modern sciences and the theories of power in the 19th century in the form of political science, theory of class struggle, technocracy, vitalism, and in every form armed to the teeth. Knowledge is power. Wissen ist Macht. This sentence fixed the course for the unavoidable politicization of thinking. Those who utter the sentence reveal the truth. However, with the utterance, they want to achieve more than truth. They want to intervene in the game of power. At the same time as Nietzsche began to expose a will to power behind every will to know, the old German social democracy exhorted its members to participate in the race for knowledge that is power. Where Nietzsche's insights were intended to be dangerously cold and without illusions, social democracy behaved pragmatically, and 
exhibited a middle-class joy in cultivation. Both spoke of power. Nietzsche by undermining bourgeois idealism with vitalism. The Social Democrats by seeking to gain access to the middle class's opportunities for power through cultivation. Nietzsche taught a realism that was supposed to make it easy for the upcoming generations of bourgeois and petty bourgeois to take their farewell from idealistic absurdities, which curbed the will to power. Social democracy strove for participation in an idealism that, to that point, had carried the promise of power within itself. In Nietzsche, the middle classes could study the subtleties and clever crassness of a will to power that had lost its ideals, while the workers' movement looked furtively at an idealism that better suited its still naive will to power. Around 1900, the radical left wing had caught up with the right wing cynicism of the masters. The race between the cynical defensive consciousness of the old bearers of power and the utopian offensive consciousness of the new bearers created the political moral drama of the 20th century. In the race for the hardest awareness of hard facts, the devil and Beelzebub trained one another. Out of the competition of consciousness arose that twilight characteristic of the present, the mutual spying out of ideologies, the assimilation of antagonisms, the modernization of fraud. In short, that situation that forces the philosopher into the void, where liars call liars liars. We detect a second aspect in Nietzsche that is relevant to contemporary times, after the first fascist Nietzsche wave has ebbed. Once more it becomes clear how Western civilization has worn out its Christian costume. After the decades of reconstruction, and the decade of utopias and alternatives, it is as if a naive elan had suddenly been lost. Catastrophes are conjured up, New values find ready markets, like all analgesics. However, the times are cynical, and no, new values have short lives. Being concerned, caring about people, securing peace, feeling responsible, caring about the quality of life and about the environment, none of that really works. Just bide your time. Cynicism stands ready in the background until the palaver has stopped and things take their course. Our lethargic modernity certainly knows how to quote unquote think historically, but it is long doubted that it lives in a meaningful history. No need for world history. The eternal recurrence of the same, Nietzsche's most subversive thought, cosmologically untenable, but culturally and morphologically fruitful, is an apt description of a resurgence of cynical motives that had developed to conscious life, especially during the time of the Roman emperors, but also to some extent in the Renaissance. The same, you know, readers note, the same is capitalised here, the same, those are the wrappings of a sober, pleasure-oriented life that has learned to live with circumstances, to be ready for anything that makes one invulnerably clever. Live in spite of history, existential reduction, socialization, quote-unquote, as if, irony about politics, mistrust toward plans, a new heathen culture that does not believe in life after death and so must seek life before death. Nietzsche's decisive self-characterization, often overlooked, is that of a cynic. With this, he became, next to Marx, the most momentous thinker of the century. 
Nietzsche's quote-unquote cynicism, cynismus, offers a modified approach to quote-unquote saying the truth. It is one of strategy and tactics, suspicion and disinhibition, pragmatics and instrumentalism. All this in the hands of a political ego that thinks first and foremost about itself, an ego that is inwardly adroit and outwardly armoured. The violent anti-rationalistic impulse in Western countries is reacting to an intellectual state of affairs in which all thinking has become strategy. This impulse shows a disgust for a certain form of self-preservation. It is a sensitive shivering from the cold breath of a reality where knowledge is power and power is knowledge. In writing, I have thought of readers, have wished for readers, who feel this way. This book, I think, could have something to say to them. The old social democracy has announced the slogan, Knowledge is Power, as a practical and reasonable prescription. It did not think too much about it. The message was simply that one has to learn something real so that life will be better later. A petty bourgeois belief in schooling had dictated the slogan. This belief is disintegrating today. Only for our cynical young medicos is there still a clear link between study and standard of living. Almost everyone else lives with the risk of learning without prospects. Those who do not seek power will also not want its knowledge. It's knowledge armaments. And those who reject both are secretly no longer citizens of this civilization. Countless numbers of people are no longer prepared to believe that one first has to learn something so that things will be better later. In these people, I believe, a suspicion is growing that was a certainty in ancient cynicism. That things must first be better before you can learn anything sensible. Socialisation through schooling, as it takes place here and in Western societies in general, is a priori stupefaction, after which scarcely any learning offers a prospect that things some time or other will improve. The inversion of the relation between life and learning is in the air. The end of the belief in education. The end of European scholasticism. That is what conservatives, as well as pragmatists, voyeurs of the decline, as well as well-meaning individuals alike, find so eerie. Basically, no one believes anymore that today's learning solves tomorrow's problems. It is almost certain, rather, that it causes them. Why a, quote-unquote, critique of cynical reason? How can I defend myself against the charge of having written a thick book at a time when even thinner books are considered impudent? As is proper, we should distinguish the occasion from the reason and the motive. <clears throat> the Occasion This year, 1981, is the 200th anniversary of the publication of Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, a date in world history. Seldom has there been a jubilee as dull as this one. It is a sober celebration. The scholars keep to themselves. 600 Kant experts gathered in Mainz. That does not produce a carnival atmosphere. At most, endless paper streamers. <laughs> yeah. An imagination would be useful to picture what would happen if the celebrated figure were to appear among the contemporaries. Is it not a sad festival where the invited guests 
secretly hope that the person being celebrated is prevented from appearing, because those who constantly invoke him would have to be ashamed on his arrival. How would we look into the penetratingly human eye of the philosopher? Uh, I read that sentence wrong. How would we look to the penetratingly human eye of the philosopher? Who could bring himself to give Kant a summary of history since 1795, the year in which the philosopher published his essay, On Perpetual Peace? Who would have the nerve to inform him about the state of the Enlightenment, the emancipation of humanity from quote-unquote self-imposed dependency? Who would be so frivolous as to explain to him Marx's quote, theses on Feuerbach, end quote? I imagine that Kant's splendid humour would help us out of our stunned state. He was, after all, an individual of the late 18th century, when even the rationalists were not yet as rigid as some today who pretend to be so free and easy. Scarcely anyone has occupied himself with Kant without touching on the enigma of his physiognomy. Applying the Roman rule of thumb, mens sana in corpore sano, does not help us grasp his appearance at all. If it is true that the spirit seeks the appropriate body. In Kant's case, it must have a, been a spirit who found pleasure in physiognomic ironies and psychosomatic paradoxes. A spirit who hid a great soul in a small, gaunt body, an upright stride under a bent back, and a gregarious, delicately cordial humour in a hypochondriacal, compulsive temperament as if to play a joke on the later devotees of the vital and the athletic. The physiognomic enigma of Kant is scarcely solved through his personality, but rather through his position in the history of ideas and of sensuousness. The Age of Enlightenment pushed the dialectic of understanding and sensuousness to the breaking point. The traces of such tensions run through the whole of Kant's work. The language of his main works reveals the violence that the process of thinking, especially in a German mind, inflicts on the sensuous. The fact that a poet like Gottfried Benn, himself stamped by the spirit of the century of natural science, could strike back against such violence by rebuking the philosopher becoming a, quote, violator of the intellect, end quote, shows how modern cynicism can become the sounding board for cogent insights against the erstwhile greatness of knowing, erkentness, that aims at the notoriously broken relation between intellect and sensuousness. Robert Musil, surely a guarantor of rationality, even beyond the limits in which it feels secure, has captured the experience of, re of a reading of Kant in a memorable passage of his Confusions of the Pupil Tourless. <clears throat> a fairly long quoted section here. Quote, in fact, Tourless had that very morning had brought the Reclam edition of that volume that he had seen at his professor's, and used the first recess to begin reading it. However, because of the profusion of brackets and footnotes, he didn't understand a single word, and when he conscientiously followed the sentences with his eyes, it was as if, it was as if an old bony hand was slowly screwing his brain out of his head. When he stopped in exhaustion, after about half an hour, he had only reached the second page, and sweat stood out on his brow. But then he gritted his teeth and read again one page further, until the recess was over. By evening, however, he did not even want to touch the book. Fear? Repulsion? He didn't quite know. <clears throat> 
Only one thing tortured him with burning clarity. That the professor, this person, who didn't look like much, had the book lying around openly in his room, as if it were for him a daily conversation. End quote. That's pages 84, 85, if you want to read that. The delicate empiricism of this sketch awakens understanding of two things. The fascination of the book and the pain it inflicts on sensitive young readers. Does not an ingenuous contact with Kantian thinking, with philosophical thinking in general, contain the risk of exposing a young consciousness to a violent and sudden ageing? What of a youthful will to know is preserved in a philosophy that makes one dizzy with its bony, spiralling turns of the screw? Is that... Is what we want to know found at the top end of the screw? Are we ourselves not perhaps so twisted at the head of the screw that we will be satisfied with what we think we know? And what does it mean that people for whom Kantian thinking is, quote, daily conversation don't, quote, look like much, end quote? Does it mean that philosophy no longer leaves any trace in life? And that reality is one thing and philosophy is something hopelessly different? From the style of philosophers' physiognomic forms, look out at us. Forms in which reason has hidden aspects of its essential character. To be quote-unquote reasonable means to put oneself into a special, rarely happy relation to the sensuous. Quote unquote, be reasonable means, practically speaking, do not trust your impulses, do not listen to your body, learn control, starting with your own sensuousness. But intellect and sensuousness are inseparable. Tuilis's outbreak of sweating after two pages of the Critique of Pure Reason contains as much truth as the whole of Kantianism. The understood mutual interaction of physis and logos is philosophy, not what is spoken. In the future, only a physiognomist can be a philosopher who does not lie. Physiognomic thinking offers a chance to escape from the regime of disembodied, and therefore evil, minds. To announce a new critique of reason also means to have a philosophical physiognomy in mind. That is not, as with Adorno, quote, aesthetic theory, end quote, but a theory of consciousness with flesh and blood and teeth. As things are, there are grounds not for a celebratory writing, festschrift, but rather for a writing celebration. Schriftfest that makes a long detour around the celebrated person out of a liking for the author. author. Quoting Eric Kessner, I don't want to say how things lie. I want to show you how the matter stands. End quote. The reason. If it is discontent in our culture that provokes criticism, there would be no age quite so disposed to criticism as ours. Yet the critical impulse has never been more strongly inclined to let itself be overpowered by a sour temperament. The tension between what wants to criticise and what should be criticised is so taut that our thinking is becoming much more morose than precise. No capacity of thought keeps pace with what is problematic. Hence the self-abdication of critique. In the utter indifference towards all problems lies the ultimate premonition of how it would be to be their equal. Because everything has become problematic, everything is also somehow 
a matter of indifference. This thread should be followed. It leads to a place where one can speak of cynicism and, quote-unquote, cynical reason. To speak of cynicism means to expose a spiritual, a moral scandal to critique. Following that, the conditions for the possibility of the scandalous are unraveled. Quote-unquote, critique undergoes a movement that at first fully lives out its positive and negative interest in the object, only in the end to run up against elementary structures of moral consciousness that are brought to expression, quote-unquote, beyond good and evil. The times are cynical everywhere you turn, and it is time to develop the connection between cynicism and realism from first principles. What did Oscar Wilde mean by his blasé statement? Quote, I am not at all cynical. I am only experienced. That's pretty much the same thing. End quote. Or Anton Chekhov, who gloomily remarked, quote unquote, No cynicism can outdo life. In the course of reflection, the well-known ambiguity in the concept of critique breaks down. At first it means to make and substantiate judgments, to judge, to condemn, then to investigate the foundations for the formation of judgments. However, if one is talking about cynical quote-unquote reason, then initially this formula takes completely then initially this formula completely takes cover behind irony. What can critique achieve today? What can it still hope for in a time that is so sick of theory? Now let us hear Walter Benjamin's answer. Quoting Einbahnstrasse, 1928, page 95. Quote, Fools who complain about the demise of critique, for its time has long since run out. Critique is a matter of proper distance. It is at home in a world where perspectives and prospects are important, and where it was still possible to assume a point of view. In the meantime, things have become much too close for comfort for human society. Quote unquote, disinterestedness. The quote-unquote, unbiased perspective, have become lies, if not the completely naive expression of plain incompetence. End quote. In a system that feels like a cross between prison and chaos, there is no standpoint for a description, no central perspective for a compelling critique. In the shattered world of multiple perspectives, the quote-unquote grand views of the whole, in fact, belong more to simple souls than to those who are enlightened and educated by the given order of things. No enlightenment can occur without destroying the effect, thinking from a point of view, and without dissolving conventional morals. Psychologically, this goes hand in hand with a scattering of the ego, literally and philosophically, with the demise of critique. But how is the contradiction to be explained that the most important renaissance of critique in the 20th century is connected with the name of Walter Benjamin, who, on the one hand, convincingly demonstrated that critique's hour had come, and on the other hand, participated with such far-reaching impact in the school of critical theory. It is possible, so he says, to assume a quote-unquote standpoint, because things have become much too close for comfort for us. But from a standpoint of having no standpoint, which has still to be more closely defined, critique has made imp impressive progress. From where then does critique speak? From what perspectives? In whose name? I believe that critical theory has found a provisional ego for critique and a quote-unquote standpoint 
that provides it with perspectives for a truly incisive critique, a standpoint that conventional epistemology does not consider. I am inclined to call it a priori pain. It is not the basis of elevated, distanced critique that achieves grand overviews, but a stance of extreme closeness. Micrology. If things have become too close for comfort for us, a critique must arise that expresses this discomfort. It is not a matter of proper distance, but of proper proximity. The success of the word concernedness, betroffenheit, grows from this soil. It is the seed of critical theory that germinates in new forms today, even among those who have scarcely heard of it. Regarding the quote-unquote concerned, would it not be fascinating to find out where they get their critical model? Anyway, in the manner of their being concerned, the defects of the forgotten source reappear. Because the sovereignty of minds, Kupfer, is always false, the new critique prepares to slip from the mind into the whole body. Enlightenment tries to move from top to bottom, politico-culturally, as well as psychosomatically. To discover the living, the living body as a sensor of the world, uh, readers note sensor here as in one who senses, not one who commits censorship. To discover the living body as a sensor of the world is to secure a realistic foundation for philosophical knowledge of the world. This is what critical theory had begun to do, hesitatingly, often aesthetically encoded, hidden in all kinds of squeamishness. Critical theory was based on the presupposition that we know this world a priori through Weltschmerz. What we perceive of the world can be ordered in psychosomatic coordinates of pain and pleasure. Critique is possible inasmuch as pain tells us what is quote-unquote true and what is quote-unquote false. In holding this view, critical theory makes the usual elitist assumption of an intact sensibility. This characterises its strength and its weaknesses. It establishes its truth and restricts the scope of its validity. One must in fact be able to muster so much elitist sensibility. It is nourished by an aversion to the deadly poison of normality in a country of hard heads and armoured souls. One should not even try to convince certain opponents. There is a generality of quote-unquote truth that is an alibi for lacking of understanding. Where the capacity for reason is not based on sensitive self-reflection, no argumentation not even one based on the most solid theory of communication, will be able to bring it about. On this quote-unquote sensitive point, critical theory was never able to get along well with the logicians among its opponents. To be sure, there are thinkers whose minds, Kupfer, are so energetic, whose nervous systems are so hardened, that to them the entire approach of critical theory must seem lacrimose. Quote unquote, sensitive theory is suspect. In fact, its founders, especially Adorno, had an exclusively narrow concept of the sensitive. A presupposition of the highest spiritual irascibility and aesthetic schooling that could never be rationalised. Its aesthetics ran just along the threshold of nausea, toward everything and anything. There was scarcely anything that took place in the practical world that did not inflict pain on it, or was spared for being suspected of brutality. For it, everything was somehow chained, like, to an accomplice. Everything was somehow chained, like an accomplice, to, quote-unquote, false living, in which there is, quote-unquote, no true living. Above all, 
It suspected everything that seemed to be pleasure and consent as being a swindle, relapse and false relief. It was inevitable that critical theory, particularly in the person of Adorno, came to feel the backlash of its exaggerations. The embodying of reasons for which it had prepared the ground with the highest sensibility could not stop at the limits within which it was constrained by its initiators. What is happening today shows how many faces critique issuing. I'll read that again. What is happening today shows how many faces critique issuing from bodily vitality can assume. Adorno belonged to the pioneers of a renewed critique of cognition that assumes an emotional a priori. In his theory, the motifs of a crypto-Buddhist spirit are at work. Those who suffer without becoming hardened will understand. Those who can hear music in moments of clarity see across to the other side of the world. The conviction that the real is written in the hand of suffering, coldness and hardness determines the way this philosopher approaches the world. Although it scarcely believed in a change for the better, it did not give in to the temptation to desensitize itself or to get used to the given order of things. To remain sensitive was, as it were, a utopian stance. To keep the senses sharpened for a happiness that will not come. A stance that nevertheless, by being prepared for happiness, protects us from the worst kind of brutalizations. Politically, and in its nerve endings, this aesthetic, this quote-unquote sensitive theory, is based on a reproachful attitude, composed of suffering, contempt, and rage against everything that has power. It makes itself into a mirror of the evil in the world, of bourgeois coldness, of the principle of domination, of dirty business and its profit motive. It is the masculine world that it categorically rejects. It is inspired by an archaic no to the world of the fathers, legislators and profiteers. Its basic prejudice is that only evil power against the living can come from this world. That is the reason for the stagnation of critical theory. The offensive manoeuvre of refusing to collaborate has long been ineffective. The masochistic element has outdone the creative element. The impulse of critical theory is becoming mature enough to burst open the strictures of negativism. In its heyday, critical theory found its adherents among those who could instinctively share their a priori a priori pain with it. Still, in a generation that began to discover what its parents had done or approved, there were many such people. And because they were many, there was once again, in the mid-60s in Germany, a thin thread of political culture, public disputes about true living. The revival of the great impulse depends on a self-reflection by the intelligentsia that was once inspired by it. In this sensitive critique, there is a paralyzing resentment. The refusal nourishes itself on an archaic rage against quote-unquote masculinity. That cynical sense for facts exhibited by political as well as scientific positivists. Adorno's theory revolted against the collaborative traits embedded embedded in the quote-unquote practical attitude. His theory tried, by means of a conceptual balancing act, to construe a knowledge that would not be power. It took refuge in the realm of the mother, in the arts and encoded longings. 
quote unquote, pictures prohibited. Do not tread with the whole foot. Defensive thinking characterizes its style. The attempt to defend a reserve where memories of happiness are bound exclusively with a utopia of the feminine. In an early work, Adorno once disclosed his emotional epistemological secret, almost without camouflage. In a few heart-rending lines, he wrote about crying in response to Schubert's music, about how tears and knowing, or kentness, are connected. This music makes us cry because we are not like it, not something complete, which turns toward the lost sweetness of life like a distant quotation. Happiness can only be thought of as something lost, as a beautiful alien. It cannot be anything more than a premonition that we approach with tears in our eyes without ever reaching it. Everything else belongs to quote-unquote false living anyway. What dominates in the world of the fathers who are always appallingly in agreement with the granite of abstractions now solidified into a system. What dominates in the world of the fathers who are always appallingly in agreement with the granite of abstractions now solidified into a system. The granite of abstractions. With Adorno, the denial of the masculine went so far that he retained only one letter from his father's name, W. The path to the meadow, Weissengrund, Wiesengrund, however, does not exactly have to be the wrong one, Holzweg. Since the dissolution of the student movement, we have been experiencing a lull in theory. There is, it is true, more erudition and sophistication than ever before, but the inspirations are sterile. The optimism of those days, that vital interests could be combined with efforts in social theory, has pretty much died out. Without this optimism, it becomes quickly apparent how boring sociology can be. For those in the Enlightenment camp, after the debacle of leftist actionism, terror, and its intensification in anti-terror, the world turned topsy-turvy. The Enlightenment camp wanted to make it possible for everyone to mourn German history, but ended in its own melancholy. Critique seems to have become even more impossible than Benjamin thought. The critical attitude turns nostalgically inward to a kind of philological gardening where Benjaminian irises, Pasolinian flowers of evil, and Freudian deadly nightshade are cultivated. Critique, in any sense of the word, is experiencing gloomy days. Once again, a period of pseudo-critique has begun, in which critical stances are subordinated to professional roles. Criticism with limited liability, petty enlightenment as a factor in success, a stance at the junction of new conformisms and old ambitions. Already in Kurt Tucholsky's work, Quote unquote, in those days, the hollowness of a critique that tried to drown out its own disillusionment could be felt. Such a critique realises that having success is a long way from having an effect. It writes brilliantly, but in vain. And that can be heard through everything. From these almost universal experiences... The latent cynicisms of present-day enlighteners are nourished. The latent cynicisms of present-day enlighteners are nourished. Pasolini, 
spiced up the dull pseudo critique a bit in that he at least designed a convincing costume that of the buccaneer pirate writings the intellectual is buccaneer not a bad dream we have scarcely ever seen ourselves that way a homosexual gave the warning signal against the effeminization of critique like Douglas Fairbanks leaping around in the cultural rigging with drawn sword, sometimes the conqueror and sometimes the conquered, knocked about unpredictably on the seas of social alienation. The blows fall on all sides. Because the costume is amoral, it fits morally like a second skin. The buccaneer cannot assume fixed standpoints because he is constantly moving between changing fronts. Perhaps Pasolini's image of the pirate intellect can reflect light on Brecht. I mean on the young, bad Brecht, not the Brecht who believed he had to conduct classes on the communist galley. The offensive posture in the myth of the buccaneer is inviting. One reservation might be the illusion that the intelligentsia is based on brawling as such. In fact, Pasolini is a beaten person, like Adorno. It is the a priori pain. It makes even the simplest things in life difficult for a person. That opens his eyes critically. And I'll read that again without the parenthesis. It is the a priori pain that opens his eyes critically. There is no significant critique without significant defects. It is the critically wounded in a culture who, with great effort, find something healing, who continue to turn the wheel of critique. Adorno dedicated a well-known essay to Heinrich Heine, Die Wunder Heine, the Sore Heine. This sore is nothing other than the one that bores away in an, any significant critique. Among the great critical achievements in modern times, sores open up everywhere. The saw, Rousseau. The saw, Schelling. The saw, Heine. The saw, Marx. The saw, Kierkegaard. The saw, Nietzsche. The saw, Spengler. The saw, Heidegger. The saw, Theodore Lessing. The saw, Freud. The saw, Adorno. Out of the self-healing of deep sores comes critiques that serve epochs as rallying points for self-knowledge. Every critique is pioneering work on the pain of the times, Zeitschmerz, and a piece of exemplary healing. It is not my ambition to enlarge this honourable infirmary of critical theories. It is time for a new critique of temperaments, where enlightenment appears as a melancholy silent science, <clears throat> where enlightenment appears as a melancholy science, it unintentionally furthers melancholic stagnation. Thus, the critique of cynical reason hopes to achieve more from a work that cheers us up, whereby it is understood from the beginning that it is not so much a matter of work, but rather of relaxation. The Motive It will already have been noticed that the justification is a bit too deliberate to be quite true. I realise I might be giving the impression that I am trying to save enlightenment and critical theory. The paradoxes of the rescue method will ensure that the first impression does not last. It might seem at first that enlightenment necessarily ends in cynical disillusionment. But the page is soon turned, and the investigation of cynicism becomes the foundation for a healthy freedom from illusions. Enlightenment was always disillusionment in the positive sense, and the more it advances, 
the closer the moment approaches when reason tells us to attempt an affirmation. A philosophy in the spirit of yes also includes the yes to the no. This is neither a cynical positivism nor an affirmative attitude. The yes I mean is not the yes of the defeated. If there is a trace of obedience in this yes, it is of the kind of, it is of the only kind of obedience that can be expected from enlightened people, namely the obedience to their own experience. European neurosis sees happiness as its goal, and an effort of reason as a way to achieve it. This compulsion has to be overcome. The critical addiction to making things better has to be given up, for the sake of the good from which one so easily distances oneself on long marches. Ironically, the aim of the most critical effort is the most ingenuous release. Shortly before Adorno died, there was a scene in a lecture hall at Frankfurt University that fits like a key into the analysis of cynicism begun here. The philosopher was just about to begin his lecture when a group of demonstrators prevented him from mounting the podium. Well, such scenes were not unusual in 1969. On this occasion, something appeared that required a closer look. Among the disruptors were some female students who, in protest, attracted attention to themselves by exposing their breasts to the thinker. Here, on one side, stood naked flesh, exercising critique. There, on the other side, stood the bitterly disappointed man, without whom scarcely any of those present would have known what critique meant. Cynicism in action. It was not naked force that reduced the philosopher to muteness, but the force of the naked. Right and wrong, truth and falsity were inextricably mixed in this scene in a way that is quite typical for cynicisms. Cynicism ventures forth with naked truths that, in the way they are presented, contain something false. Wherever deceptions are constitutive for a culture, wherever life and society succumbs to a compulsion for lying, there really speaking the truth has an element of aggression, an unwelcome exposure. There, really speaking the truth has an element of aggression, an unwelcome exposure. Nevertheless, the instinct for disclosure is stronger in the long run. Only a radical nakedness and bringing things out in the open can free us from the compulsion for mistrustful imputations. Wanting to get to the naked truth is one motive for a desperate sensuousness, which wants to tear through the veil of conventions, lies, abstractions and discretions in order to get to the bottom of things. I want to pursue this theme, a mixture of cynicism, sexism, matter-of-factness and psychologism constitutes the mood of the superstructure in the West, a twilight mood, good for owls and philosophy. At the bottom of my motivations is a childlike veneration for what, in the Greek sense, was called philosophy. For which, moreover, a family tradition of reverence is partly responsible. My grandmother, a teacher's daughter from an idealistic home, often recounted proudly and respectfully that it was Kant who wrote Critique of Pure Reason, and Schopenhauer, The World as Will and Representation. And perhaps there are even more such magical books in the world that we cannot read because they are too difficult but which we must admire from the outside, like something from someone very great. Is there no philosophy that does not screw our brains from our heads with its old bony hand? The dream that I pursue is to see the dying tree of philosophy bloom once again, in a blossoming without disillusionment, 
abundant with bizarre thought flowers. Reds, blue and white, shimmering in the colours of the beginning, as in the Greek dawn when Theoria was beginning, and when, inconceivably and suddenly, like everything clear, understanding found its language. Are we really culturally too old to repeat such experiences? The reader is invited to sit for a while under this tree, which, strictly speaking, cannot exist. I promise to promise nothing. Above all, no new values. The critique of cynical reason, to quote Heinrich Heine's characterization of the Aristophanian comedies, endeavours to pursue the, quote, deep idea of world annihilation, end quote, on which the gay science is based. Quote, which from there, like a fantastically ironic magic tree, shoots up with blossoming thought ornaments, singing nightingale nests, and clambering monkeys. End quote. Quote from Die Bede von Lucke. Preface written in Munich, summer 1981.